Let us now write our first GPU program. There are many different kinds of GPUs and many different programming environments for programming them. But the same basic principles hold with all GPUs. So once you get used to GPU programming in one environment, you can easily transfer the skills to another system. In this course, we will use GPUs manufactured by NVIDIA, and we will use NVIDIA's CUDA programming environment. CUDA is basically C++ with some GPU-related extensions. You write CUDA code, and instead of compiling it with GCC, you compile it with NVCC. Now, just compiling your C++ code with NVCC doesn't yet do anything useful. Your main function will still run on the CPU, and the GPU will just sit idle unless you explicitly ask it to do something. If you want to run some code on the GPU, you define a special C++ function that is called a kernel. And then, in your main function, you can ask the GPU to launch many threads, all of which run your kernel function. So what does it look like? Let's say we have got 100 by 128 things that we would like to calculate. We'd like to call some function foo 12,800 times with different parameter values. And here, all function calls are independent. We could safely run all of them in parallel. To do anything on the GPU, we will need to define a kernel function. We use the magic keyword global to denote that this is a kernel function. It's something that runs on the GPU, and it's an entry point from the CPU side to the GPU side. Here, I decided to call this function a mykernel, but you can call it whatever you want. Then, we will define a main function. This is where our program will start as usual, and this will run on the CPU as usual. In the CPU side code, we can do anything we usually do in C++, but we can also ask the GPU to create threads and run a kernel. We do it with this magic triple angle bracket notation. Now, threads are organized in blocks. So here I decided to create 100 blocks, each with 128 threads. Blocks are numbered from 0 to 99. Threads within each block are numbered from 0 to 127. And all threads in all blocks will run on the GPU and run the same function mykernel. So on the GPU side, we will now run the same function many times. To do something useful, when a thread starts to run mykernel, it needs to know what is its block number and what is its thread number. And it can get this by reading special variables, block index and thread index. So now, for instance, the first thread will set i to 0 and j to 0. And the last thread will set i to 99 and j to 127. And then each thread will just run foo of i and j, whatever it is. And this way we will run foo of 0, 0, foo 0, 0,0, foo 0, 0,1, foo 0,2, etc. all the way to foo 99,127. And all of this happens on the GPU. Now, how much of this happens in parallel depends on the GPU we are using and on what happens in function foo but there is certainly going to be at least some amount of parallelism here. After all, each block consists of warps, and all threads in one warp work in parallel. So, informally, our CUDA code can be seen as a parallel version of this for loop. We have seen earlier that using OpenMP, we could easily create multiple CPU threads that run parts of the loop in parallel. Now we know how we can use CUDA to create multiple GPU threads that basically do the same. Just note that if we were programming CPUs, we would maybe create four or eight CPU threads here. But with GPUs, it may make sense to create a much larger number of threads. Let's now do some actual number crunching. Here is a simple search problem we would like to solve. We've got 30 numbers here the fifth power of 1, 2, 3, etc. And we would like to split these numbers in two parts, like this, so that the sums of the two parts are as close to each other as possible. 
Here we got pretty close, roughly 68 million in one part and roughly 66 million in the other part. But clearly we could do better, say move some small numbers from left to right. But what is the optimal solution here? How do we find it? We could try to design a clever algorithm for solving this, but to stay true to the theme of our course, let's now solve this by using brute force. We will start with a simple sequential CPU solution and then turn it into a massively parallel GPU solution. Because there are 30 numbers, there are 2 to the power of 30 possible ways to split this in two parts. And we will simply check each of them. We can represent each partition as a 30-bit number x, where bit 0 indicates that the corresponding number is in the first part, and bit 1 indicates that the corresponding number is in the second part. And if you are given such a bit string x, we can easily calculate how good a split it is. For each bit 1, we add the corresponding fifth power. For each bit 0, we subtract the corresponding fifth power. And finally, variable a will hold the sum of the second part minus the sum of the first part. And we return the absolute value of this difference. The smaller the return value, the better our split is. So we would like to just find a bit string x that minimizes value of x. Simple. Now it's easy to write a sequential CPU solution, just check all possible bit strings x, that is all possible integers x between 0 and 2 to the power of 30, calculate value of x and see what gives the smallest value. And now this is what we would like to compute with the GPU in a massively parallel manner. Now to do anything on a GPU we will need to create tons of threads, and threads are always organized in blocks that consist of warps. So before we can do anything, we will need to decide how to split our work among blocks and threads. We already know we will need to have lots of threads in any GPU program. But if we use too many threads, one thread can do only very little useful work. Say, if we had so many threads that each thread would only check one case, then each thread would do just a handful of arithmetic operations. And the overhead related to launching the kernel and especially reporting back the result would dominate. So we need lots of threads, but not too many. Let's start in the middle. How many threads do we have per block? This choice here is pretty arbitrary, as we aren't really going to use the concept of a block for anything good. But we have to pick something. And a block always consists of warps, and a warp is 32 threads, so we better pick some nice multiple of 32. Something like 64 is often a pretty safe choice for our hardware. So 64 threads per block. How many blocks? One block is way too little. Then there would be only two warps available that might be ready for execution. Way too little parallelism. One million blocks would be probably too much. Then we would have 64 million threads, and each thread would only check 16 cases. Way too little work per thread. So let's consider something like roughly 1000 blocks. This would mean that there are roughly 2000 warps available, which should give plenty of room for parallelism. And each thread will then check roughly 16,000 cases, which sounds to me like a reasonable amount of work per thread. And as we represent one case with a 30-bit number, it's now easy to split the work. The block index represents the highest 10 bits. So for instance, the first block is responsible for checking all cases in which the highest 10 bits are zeros, and the last block is responsible for checking all cases in which the highest 10 bits are ones. The thread index represents the next six bits. So for instance, the first thread of the first block will be responsible for checking all cases in which the highest 16 bits are zeros. So for each thread, 16 highest bits are fixed to some values, and it only needs to go through all possible ways to set the lowest 14 bits. Now, one final detail. How do the threads coordinate their work? How do we keep track of the best solution we have found? 
we could try to have one variable somewhere in the GPU memory, and then all threads would maintain there the global optimum, but this would require some synchronization between threads. Let's make our life easy and implement a solution that doesn't need any synchronization. We got 16,000 threads, and we will simply allocate an array with 16,000 elements. We will let each GPU thread store the best result in its own part there. And finally, we will find the best among these values on the CPU side in post-processing. After all, checking 16,000 cases doesn't really take any time, as we are doing in total roughly 1 billion units of work. So our plan is now ready, let's implement it. We start with the kernel. There's the global keyword indicating that this is a kernel. It takes one argument, a pointer to the array in which we will store the results. This is GPU code, so the pointer will point to the GPU memory. And as usual, we start by asking what is my block and thread index. So the plan is that x3 gives the highest 10 bits x2 gives the next 6 bits, and our task is to go through all values of x1, which gives the lowest 14 bits. In the very end, we will store the best solution we have found in our own element in array R. No coordination needed, as there is only going to be one thread that ever touches this specific element. And then, this was everything that was really specific to GPUs. We'll just write normal C++ code now that goes through all values of x1 and sees what gives the best value. Like this. Check all x1s, put together x1, x2, x3 to form bit vector x. Check how good it is and keep track of the best x we have seen. And we are done. Except that, of course, we will need to somehow run this kernel. So let us switch to our main function. This is something our CPU will run. Let's first define the parameters that we will use. 1024 blocks, each with 64 threads. Then comes a new thing. We need to allocate somehow GPU memory, so that each thread can write its own part of the result there. We can't use something like malloc here. It would allocate CPU memory. So we will need to use a special function, CUDA malloc, which allocates a block of GPU memory. Now please note that this pointer rGPU is totally meaningless for us. It is some memory address that makes only sense on the GPU side. But we can pass it to the kernel, and because the kernel runs on the GPU, the kernel code can use this pointer. And this is exactly what we will do next. We will launch this kernel, with the right settings. This number of blocks, this number of threads per block. And then we pass it a pointer to the newly allocated block of GPU memory. After the kernel launch, the GPU is doing its work and the CPU can continue simultaneously. We need to somehow get the results back from the GPU memory to the CPU memory so that our CPU can then find the global optimum. We can't directly read GPU memory. So what we do is this. We first allocate the same amount of CPU memory. I'm using STD vector here, but malloc would of course also work. And then I'm using a special function CUDA memcopy that is able to initiate data transfer between GPU and CPU. This time we are asking it to copy from device, which means the GPU memory, to host, which means the CPU memory. By the way, this call will automatically do synchronization for us. It will ask the GPU to wait for all threads to complete their work, and it will copy data only after that. Once the data is safely back in the CPU memory, we can release the GPU memory block that we had reserved, and we are done. Now we have got a perfectly normal STD vector, and we can continue with normal CPU code to post-process the results and print out the global optimum. Compile it, run it, and see what happens. As a baseline, the sequential CPU solution would take roughly 38 seconds. If you try out the GPU version,
the performance improvement is really significant. It takes only 0.3 seconds. And this already includes all overhead related to allocating memory, launching kernels, copying results back, doing post-processing, etc. And if you're curious, here is an optimal solution. You can find a split in which the sums differ by only one. Just one very, very important word of warning. The code that you saw in the slides omits all error checking. All CUDA-related operations may fail, and they actually often do fail for a number of different reasons. And it is very important to see if you were really successful in instructing the GPU to perform all key steps. So a more correct version of the CPU set code would look something like this. All CUDA library functions are wrapped inside a macro check that looks at the return value and reports an error if something went wrong. And also, after the kernel launch, we use CUDA get last error to see that the kernel launch didn't fail. In all your exercises, you must check for errors in all CUDA operations. And please don't try to be lazy and only add error checking in the final version. All those error checks are going to be extremely valuable, especially when you are debugging your code. So that's all for this part of the lecture. We have seen a complete example of doing computations using the GPU. In all CUDA programs, we will define a GPU side function known as a kernel that does all GPU side work. The kernel itself is usually doing only a small amount of work, but we launch thousands of threads, all of which run the kernel code. So overall, we can get a lot of work done. But just defining the kernel won't do any good yet. Your main function starts on the CPU, and you need to explicitly tell what the GPU should do. Typically, in your CPU side code, you will pre-process your data so that it is suitable for the kernel, and you will allocate some GPU memory and copy your input data there. You will launch the kernel, which will read the input from the GPU memory and write the result back to the GPU memory. Then you will copy the results back to the CPU memory, release GPU memory, and finally post-process the results if needed. And of course, you can do this many times in your program. You can launch kernels many times. So you could have, for instance, one kernel that does pre-processing, another kernel for heavy computations, and yet another kernel for some post-processing. In the next part, we will apply these ideas to our sample application and start to worry about memory access patterns in GPU-side code.